Okay, so uh, we talked about that water, um, again, uh, gets through cell membranes with the help of proteins called aquaporins. And now we have a difference in this dynamic of um, uh, osmosis and diffusion in terms of plant and animal cells, which is due to one of their big differences, and that is the presence of a cell wall in plant cells, but not in animal cells. So let's focus just on animal cells right now, and we'll come back to the plant cells in a minute. You see here that this describes that this cell is surrounded by a hypotonic solution in this situation. What's hypotonic mean? Less. Less what? Less solute outside here, which means water-wise. What? More water. So you would say water would move in. And this flimsy little plasma membrane that an animal cell is surrounded by is flimsy. And if enough water comes in, just like if you fill up a water balloon with enough water, it's a good analogy, it will burst. Okay. Let's skip over to here. What if the cell is surrounded by a solution with lots of concentration of solute? That means there's much less water than inside the cell. It's hard to see this arrow, so I'll draw you one. Water is going to diffuse out of the cell. It's going to shrivel up. And if it gets too dehydrated, we've talked about, its chemistry will be messed up enough to where it may die. Okay. What's the best situation? For a, an animal cell, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's just right. Not too much of this, not too much of that. And in this case, what just right means is isotonic. And so all of your cells are surrounded by fluid. Even if they're right next, up, right next to another cell, they have the little layer of water in between them. And so one of the things that's happening in your body overall is the amount of total water in you is being regulated so that it stays isotonic with the inside of your cells. That's if everything is good and you're healthy. And the main part of you that helps do that regulation is your kidneys. If you get too watery, you urinate more. Your kidneys filter it out more. If you get less watery, your kidneys help save water. So, how about a plant cell? Well, a plant cell is different because it has a cell wall. That's structurally how it's different. But it's also different in terms of what situation is best, so to speak. So, if you're surrounded by an isotonic solution and you're a plant cell, you're okay, right? But you're kind of like, now I'm going to use a basketball analogy with a nice thick wall compared to a balloon. You're kind of like a basketball that's not very fully inflated. And if you're a plant and all of your cells are like that, you're kind of you're kind of wilted a little bit, right? If your cells are surrounded by real dry hypertonic solution, you're really wilted. Your cell membrane might even pull away from the cell wall. You've lost so much water and you're on your way possibly again to dying, just like an animal cell from dehydration. But if you're a plant cell surrounded by a lot of water, so the water's diffusing in, it's kind of like now this basketball is full of air. And what's the air inside a basketball doing? It's pushing out on the walls of the basketball. So water and all other kinds of particles inside a plant cell, if they bump into the plasma membrane on their way out, but they bump into a place where they can't get through, they just push, and they push outward, and that makes this cell nice and inflated. And for no good reason whatsoever, somebody decided, let's give a word to that and only use it when we talk about plant cells. That's turgid. It means firm, and this pressure pushing outward of the stuff inside is called turgor pressure. It's the same kind of pressure of stuff pushing outward on this animal cell, but for no good reason, we don't use the word turgor pressure when we're talking about animal cells, even though it's the same thing. But for the plant now that's made up of a whole bunch of cells, 
it's beneficial that every cell is nice and firm because now you can stand up tall and in your competition for sunlight, that's an advantage. So big difference between the desired state, so to speak, for plant cells, be surrounded by a hypotonic watery solution compared to animal cells, ideal to be surrounded by an isotonic solution. So this is kind of neat. I'm going to just see it here and then we're going to see a video in a second where you can actually see it work. This kind of vacuole, we might have mentioned real fast when we did cells and vacuoles. Um, this kind of vacuole that you see here, like fully expanded, has water diffused into it. And then, and then what cell parts would cause that thing to contract and become, look like that and squeeze the water out when it contracts? Microfilaments, if you said that, good for you, right? And does that require energy, you figure, from the cell? Yes, it does, right? So this is not passive transport. This is active, right? But this is not the same kind of transport as having stuff go through the plasma membrane. These vacuoles, you can kind of see them. It looks like a star. They have channels that connect right to the plasma membrane, and that water is being squeezed out. These single-celled things, like this paramecium, are the only place you find these kind of contractile vacuoles. You don't find them in your kind of cells, plant cells, any other kind of cells. They have evolved as a way to regulate the water in these cells because they live in fresh water. And so they've evolved this vacuole that as the fresh water diffuses in, just as fast as it diffuses in, it gets pumped out and they maintain that state called equilibrium. Now I'm gonna come back to them, that because I meant to say this in the earlier slide where we had that word up there. What does equilibrium mean? It doesn't necessarily mean things are equal overall, like just as much of this inside as outside. Isotonic and equilibrium are not the same thing. What is equal about equilibrium is how much this stuff is going out compared to going in. That's what's equal. So this maintains equilibrium for this little creature, even though its cytoplasm is still more concentrated, hypertonic, then the water outside, which is hypotonic. So this whole system is not isotonic inside the cell compared to out, but it is at equilibrium due to the action of this active transport counteracting the passive transport of osmosis water diffusing in. Make sense? Good. If not, listen to that slide again, because this is the, that's a big concept. So now, uh, this we've already said. Uh, in fact, I got ahead of myself a little bit talking about the plant cell. This is this is all the stuff I said about what happens in a plant cell and different uh, uh, solutions of con different concentration. So, um, in passive diffusion, substances always move. Pause the slide. Take a shot at that. Start the slide. I'll walk you through it. Okay, here we go. So it's passive diffusion, right? We have the word always here. That's exclusive. What did we learn about passive diffusion? The net movement is always from the area of higher concentration to lower. Okay? Not fewer molecules and more molecules, right? Because let's say you're a cell, right? And you're surrounded by the ocean, right? Well, I guarantee you, there's more potassium ions, for instance, we're going to come to those in a second, in this ocean than there are inside of you. But inside of you is a higher concentration of potassiums than out there. So it's concentration, not number. That's the key. So that's why A is not good. More molecules to fewer. More to fewer is the idea. But again, it's not number of molecules. It's concentration. So now we have area of what? Lower to higher? No, higher to lower. Always the direction of diffusion is from the area of higher concentration to lower. So uh, we'll throw this little wrap thing here, um, but not here online. We'll do this in class.
I don't know why that's coming up. So I'm going to keep going and see if I can get this. Okay, sorry, not sure what that was. Active transport here, right? Now we're switching to active transport. This is always helped by a protein. Those proteins are called pumps. And most of the time, this is not an always, but for your EOC test, it probably will. They are going to move solutes against their concentration gradient from where they are less concentrated to an area where they're more concentrated. Okay. This again requires energy in the form of ATP molecules, those little batteries. And like we saw before, because that contractile vacuole was a type of active transport, it often counteracts the passive diffusion to produce this state of equilibrium. Okay. So here, they're, they're not very specific with these objectives. They will explain the role of cell membrane using active and passive transport. Well, the role of the cell membrane here for passive transport is it contains these proteins that we call pumps. Okay, <clears throat> so to describe active transport, every textbook I've ever seen uses uh, the first one discovered and described well, the active transport protein called the sodium potassium pump and so that's what we're going to use also this one happens to pump both of those kind of ions it happens to pump them in opposite directions but the way it works is similar to any kind of pump okay so um here's the situation like it says in this bullet in your typical animal cell but this is also true of lots of protists uh, you know like that paramecium and whatever there is a higher concentration of potassiums inside the cell than outside, and there's a higher concentration of sodiums outside than inside. And that is healthy, so to speak. That is normal. And so cells have evolved a way to keep it that way. Now, in this membrane, there are channels that sodium can diffuse, and it would diffuse in because there's more of them outside, and there are other channels, remember they're specific, these proteins, that potassium could diffuse out. But then there are also these proteins, which we're talking about, the sodium potassium pumps, that will send these things right back the other way. So I'm going to draw three potassiums out here and one here, just as an example. When they diffuse out, like this one has, this pump might pump it right back in and maintain this gradient. And the point here of this pump is that that same pump can also take sodiums that have leaked in, by leak I should say diffuse in, and it can pump them back out to maintain more sodiums outside. Okay, so now we'll have a little video. I'm having trouble with these videos when I'm actually doing this. Uh, I can't tell what you're seeing, but here I'll struggle through this. Okay, so I described it to you and you can watch that video and then you can follow my words there, but I, I can't narrate over the video it sounds like. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce one more kind of pump to you because it has to do with something else that we've talked about, pH. Because what it pumps are protons. Remember what protons are about? What can protons do? If they add to a water molecule, which they're going to be attracted to the negative part of it, they will form that, oops, that should be a plus up there. They will form that thing that makes this solution more acidic, a hydronium ion, right? So if I'm a proton pump, and here's inside the cell, cytoplasm, I'll pump these protons outside. I have made it more acidic outside. What's that mean for the pH number? The pH, again, is lower if I'm more acidic. We'll keep practicing that, right? This is an active transport pump. It requires cell energy to do that. And the reasons why a cell has evolved to do this are many, many, many. We're going to come to a big one when we talk about photosynthesis and respiration, but that's not until the third quarter, okay? Lysosomes have them. Because lysosomes, remember they have enzymes inside a lysosome. These are among the kind of enzymes that work well in a low pH. And so when the proton pumps in lysosome membranes, 
pump protons into a lysosome. They drive that pH down low, and these enzymes work well. So, wrapping it up. Now, this, I love this diagram because it shows so many things, right? It shows, number one, some particles can get through the bilayer. Some need the help of proteins. Some can get through passively, either the bilayer. We call that, again, simple diffusion. Those would be nonpolar, non-charged kind of particles. Like what kind of particles? Let's be specific. The oxygen gas that diffuses in and out of your cells, that's nonpolar. That's something that diffuses simply. Okay? Facilitated diffusion, right? These are charged particles like sodium we've talked about, potassium, right? Also, remember, water is a polar charged particle. And we call that channel protein an aquaporin. Okay, but notice what they always are if they're passive, if it's diffusion, the net direction of this movement is from where there's more of these to where there's less. Whether it's facilitated or not, that is always true of diffusion. Active transport, again, requires energy, the help of a protein, we call that a pump. And like I said, it's not always, but it's almost always, and on a test it'll probably be always the direction of that movement is from an area of lesser concentration to an area of more. Okay, there's another kind of active transport in which the particles don't actually cross the, the phospholipid bilayer part of the membrane, but they do get into and out of a cell. And here we have prefixes that mean into and out of, exo means out of, endo means into, so this kind of transport that involves vesicles, right? We've already seen this when we talked about the Golgi. And we talked about molecules being made in a cell, like enzymes, for instance, in a pancreas cell, wrapped up in a vesicle, and then moved to the outside of the cell. So we've talked about this, I don't remember if we named it or not, then as exocytosis, right? We also talked about a lysosome might digest particles that a cell brought in in a way that caused them to be wrapped in a membrane inside a food vacuole. That's endocytosis. So whether we called it that or not at the time, we have talked about this kind of transport and all that activity moving around vesicles and bringing them in, all that requires ATP energy and that's why this is active kind of transport. So here's some of that. I'll play that in class. You can play it there. Here's a cool one. There's, there's one kind of endocytosis. If this cell is eating things, phage is an eat word. It's called phagocytosis. This is what white blood cells do to things like bacteria. The green things here are bacteria. That's a big white blood cell, and you see it moving around. Remember how it moved? Microfilaments caused it to ooze around. We call that amoeboid movement. So that's that. Kind of neat. It's going to gobble up some of that little green bacteria cells there. I'm going to let you play it at home. There you go. And there we go. The end or beginning rather in this case of another day the end of a video the beginning of, this was a pretty neat scene from jack's speech uh, last month hope you enjoyed bye